Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Perhaps I shouldn't tell you the rest, but in my opinion, this part is the best. So sit down and listen if you have the time as I tell you the tale of the Kingdom of Rhyme. The itsy bitsy spider crawled up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the itsy bitsy spider went up the spout again. If you ignored the hordes of monsters lurking outside its walls, the giant spiders in its sewers, and the occasional flying cows in its skies, then the Kingdom of Rhyme was a truly peaceful place. Everyone knew that the Kingdom of Rhyme was riddled with beasts of various kinds, but there's much disagreement on how they came to be there. What came first, the kingdom or the mobs? I won't bore you with the debate, but you should know not even the grand wall that surrounded the kingdom could keep out every mob in the forest, as proven when King Cole and his trusted advisors surveyed a nearby breach. The water spout of all things. I thought the spiders were too big to fit. It must have been a small one, said Rye as he ducked to look into the water spout's opening. Mallard turned to the king. What should we do, your highness? The mobs are growing restless again. The king didn't answer. Not right away. He was busy trying to distract the young prince and princess. The prince could not be contained, however, and soon broke away to join Rai at the spout. I could fit in here. Look, I'm a spider. Thankfully, the prince had his father's optimistic spirit and was too short to climb through. The princess clutched her father's robe timidly. Is the spider still in there? The king crouched down to her level. If it is, it must be a shy spider. Maybe if you came up with a song for it, it would be less scary for both of you. Okay. She jumped to join her brother at the opening. Meanwhile, Mallard's ever-professional smile was starting to slip. The monster's in the pipes, your highness. What should we do? The king glanced at the pipe and smiled. It's only a spider, Mallard. The guards can handle it. Only a spider? And what about last time when it was only a skeleton? Three of the sheep nearly died. The king was a calm man. Some would say he was peaceful to a fault, impossibly cheerful, even in the midst of the queen's death and childbirth nine years ago, and no one knew why or how. He took a deep breath and answered calmly. Things were worse before the wall. You may remember when I first... Yes, we know. The king raised a disappointed eyebrow, but would not be deterred. He waved for his children to join them. Jack and Jill don't. This is a good time to tell them. <sighs> Rye herded the prince and the princess towards their father. Jill sang to herself as they came. The king knelt to their level again and looked them in the eyes. What is it? I think it's time you learned how the kingdom came to be. Oh. Ooh. Did you know that I fought a wither and won? Ooh. You did? Yes, the deadly spawn of the nether itself. The skulls to summon it were a nightmare to collect. But it was said that if you defeated one, you would earn yourself a wishing star. And so I did. Whoa. Every star grants three wishes. I used the first wish for this kingdom. Granted, I was young at the time. I knew nothing about ruling a kingdom, but a kingdom I got, complete with subjects and advisors and servants. I soon realized my mistake when the monster started to attack. It never occurred to me that where I made this wish was first and foremost home to deadly creatures. In order to remedy this mistake, I used my next wish to build the wall. But even that didn't solve the issue. So I realized that wishes will not fix my foolish mistakes. Only I can do that. Which means the only sensible thing to do with my final wish is to leave it to the two of you as long as you promise to use it wisely. Wishes are only good if you use them with good, selfless intentions. Jack nodded eagerly. Jill nodded less so, the responsibility weighing heavily on her little mind. Now, as for this spider. Yes, your highness. 
Install a grate. Mallard nodded dutifully as the group began to leave. Well, most of the group. <sighs> Sconce. The candlestick maker was staring up at the wall with a taut expression on his face and an inspired gleam in his eyes. Huh? Moving along? Ah, yes, I will be there soon. And so he would be. He would be at the solution to their problem soon. Very soon, indeed. Old King Cole was a merry old soul, and a merry old soul was he. He called for his pipe, and he called for his bowl, and he called for his fiddlers three. The king had only three advisors, and they called themselves the fiddlers, because for no discernible reason, all three of them could play the fiddle, and that was all they had in common, aside from the fact that they were all masters of their given crafts. Rye, a friendly but quiet bloke, whose only interesting trait, being he was blind in his left eye, could bake absolutely anything better than anyone with less preparation and fewer steps. Mallard, the most loyal and calculative gentleman you'd ever meet, was unnervingly precise at butchering any animal given him, and his station would always be clean through the process, almost as though he didn't want to stain his spotless reputation with the blood of his game. And finally, Sconce. The candlestick maker was a man of many crafts, all of which he mastered to the point of second nature. Even at this very given moment, he was hanging a new batch of candles from their wicks while reading a book of enchantments and encouraging a swarm of bees to find their way to one of his many hives that buzzed in their own glass chamber. That's right, go on then, your queen's already here. I will not escort you this time, you're not the only ones who are busy. Suddenly, a series of clicks and a thud made the busy beekeeper drop everything he was doing as he flew to his cluttered workbench. Well, hello there. Any outsider would have assumed he was talking to a pile of patchy stone mechanisms, unsecured redstone, and scraggly wooden bits. And that outsider would be right. But they would still be shocked to watch the pile of scraps sit up in a very human way. A machine, but in the shape of a human, stared with hollow stone eyes at its maker. It looked down and flexed its wood and stone fingers. <laughs> Look at you, already running a systems test. I wondered when you would wake up. Well, let's see how you respond to commands. Stand up, will you? As if by magic, or redstone, but there isn't much difference. The machine looked from sconce to the floor, then swung its heavy legs across the table, scattering many spare parts and tools before planting its feet firmly just in front of sconce. Brilliant. Now... Mm, pick up that clutter. His creation obeyed without hesitation, bending over and handling the items with great care for every step. It held the mess in its pipe-like arms expectantly, unsure of what to do next. Well done. You can put those down. What shall we do next? Mm, should I... No. Oh, what could it hurt? Let's test the range in memory. Go get me three eggs from the kitchen and... Bring them back here. It tilted its head for a moment, processing this information. Not a second later, the machine marched out the door as Sconce's excited laughter echoed from behind. Its journey to the kitchen was uneventful, aside from a few well-earned gapes and gasps from the staff along the way. It retrieved the eggs from the pantry and began its march back to Sconce's chamber until a short human suddenly blocked its path. Whoa, what are you? Well, uh, don't move. I, I need to go get my sister. Jill! Jill, come look! The boy ran off. Sconce's contraption couldn't move. It had been commanded not to. It wasn't still for long before Jack dragged Jill into view. Whoa! What is it? I don't know. I just found it. What is it holding? Can it talk? Could it talk? Apparently not. She can! She said her name! It's a she? Yes, it's a she. It has to be a she. Jack jumped up and down in front of the machine's face. We need a new nursemaid. Father said so. You're going to be our new nursemaid. Come play with us. <gasps> yes, come play with us. You would think the machine would have been torn, that there would be a moment of hesitation between the demands of these children and the demands of her creator. There was not. She followed Jack and Jill into the garden as Jack took one of the eggs from her hands. Oh, we can play with these. Wait, what is your name again? I missed it. The machine attempted to speak again. Isn't it obvious? It's Humpty Dumpty. 
Rockabye baby on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bough breaks, the cradle will fall, and down will come baby, cradle and all. It really is quite miraculous to watch children grow, but also quite slow. So seeing as though it's not important to our story, we'll skip ahead. The unfortunately named Humpty Dumpty, or Humpty for short, acted as the children's nursemaid, playmate, and personal guardian for the rest of their childhood. She monitored their adventures, cared for them when they were ill, even assisted in some harmless pranks. But her duties grew less tiresome, not that she grew tired, as the children grew to young adulthood. Adventures and pranks only occurred every few weeks now, such as when the trio decided to climb a tree in the courtyard for the sole reason being that they could. Jack, don't climb too high, Jill shouted from the sturdy limbs where she and Humpty balanced. <laughs> I'm fine. I've been up here plenty of times. Yes, but you were significantly smaller then. It's only rocking a bit. The prince slowly laid his back against the branch as it swayed beneath him. It didn't take long for Jill to come up with a quick little ditty for the occasion. She usually made up songs when she was stressed or uncomfortable. It didn't matter what about as long as it distracted her. rock a baby in the treetop When the wind blows, the cradle will rock <laughs> When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall. <laughs> I'm not going to fall! As he said this, he shifted his weight to the end of the branch, just enough for it to snap. <laughs> but the concept of gravity was no match for Humpty's instant reflexes. The nursemaid machine swung around the nearest limb and caught Jack by the shin just before his face met the ground. Oh, oh, oh. And down will oh. come, baby, cradle and all. <laughs> Humpty slowly lowered Jack to the ground as Jill scampered down behind her. Just as the two had helped Jack to his feet, Scouts approached them with a smile. Well, that looked exciting. Too exciting. Don't encourage his stunts. I'm fine. Besides, Humpty wouldn't have let me fall. Scouts' friendly expression drooped for a moment. Speaking of which, Humpty, will you come with me for a moment? If her eyes could have widened, they would have. She was never asked to do things away from the children, not since she had officially been accepted as their caretaker. She stepped towards Sconce, looking back significantly at her charges. Just you. They'll be fine for a few minutes. Humpty followed her maker dutifully. They stopped much sooner than she had anticipated, behind one of the tall hedges where a smiling mallard stood waiting. Ah, good. You were able to pull it away for a moment. Humpty tilted her head quizzically as Sconce's friendly expression dropped from his face as quickly as Jack had fallen from the tree. <sighs> Humpty, what's your highest priority of all your responsibilities? Looking back from where they just came, Humpty pointed past the hedge. The children and their well-being? Humpty nodded sharply. But what about the rest of the kingdom? You meant to create a warrior that could vanquish monsters, not serve tea and swat flies. Her duty is to protect from conflict, not seek it out. Your machine is brilliant, Scots, but you and I both know that it's not what you intended. What changed? What made it deviate from your design? She didn't deviate from my design. That's what astounds me. Scott sighed as he studied Humpty. She stared back attentively, unsure what to do without any commands. The candlestick maker pointed to Humpty's chest where a human's heart is usually found. I designed her with a series of loyalty thresholds. This allows her to filter commands. It's why she prioritizes the royal's requests over ours and doesn't take any from anyone beneath our rank. It also keeps her from accepting any commands that could harm her charges. So... If one of us, far be it from me, commanded her to hurt one of the heirs? She wouldn't do it. Fascinating. So if you hadn't installed it? It would be like letting a wolf into a sheep's pen. Hmm. You are a genius, Scots. I trust your design. I suppose we'll find another solution to the monster problem. <laughs> yes, I'm certain we will. These things take time. Yes, Mallard said as his penetrating gaze turned to Humpty. Yes, they do. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown and Jill came tumbling after. The king had sent his daughter to fetch a pail of water and she dragged Jack along with her. Let me get this straight. 
Father told you to get water, and you just assumed he meant you, not a servant, go all the way to the well on the hill outside the castle walls on the one day that Humpty is nowhere to be found. He said, and I quote, Go fetch a pail of water. This is the only place to get a pail of water since the spiders started coming through the pipes again. And he asked me specifically to do it. You're sure he didn't mean for you to tell a servant? <sighs> Father always has a reason for telling us to do things. Why should this time be any different? Well, it's it's just that this is the one time that Humpty's not around and no one knows why or where she went. Father is well aware that she's gone, and you don't think it's strange at all? I know it sounds... Do. The twins whirled around to see Sconce marching towards them. A familiar redstone contraption looked dazed at his side. Humpty! The two of them sprinted down the hill, which, as most of us know, is not a wise idea, and Jack did, in fact, fall the rest of the way down with Jill tumbling after. But they both jumped up with minimal injuries before Sconce could fuss over them. Are you all right? We're fine. Humpty, what happened to you? You're damaged. The princess was correct. Humpty looked down absently at the hole that gaped near the middle of her chest, leaving her core circuitry exposed. Never mind all that. I'll tell you on the way. Humpty, come along. The candlestick maker grabbed one of each of their wrists and pulled them further across the hill. What? Hey! We need to get you away from the kingdom. Why? Sconce, tell us what's going on. There's no time. Please, just trust me for a moment. It will make sense later. No! The prince ripped his arm out of Sconce's grip and stood his ground. You tell us right now or we'll go back to the castle ourselves and find out. Jill broke free herself and skipped to hide behind her brother. (laughs) The king, your father was killed. (laughs) What? His wishing star is missing. Someone killed him to get it. That's why we must go. They'll kill you too. Jack processed this information for a full two seconds before turning on his heels and jumping to run back towards the castle walls. Jack! Humpty, stop him. Humpty, let me go. I need need to make sure. An explosion, a sound the children had only heard deep in the woods far from harm's reach, shot through the still air. A hole gaped in the center of the castle right where the king's chamber should have been. Jack stopped struggling. Jill sank to her knees. Come, please. We must hide before they realize you're gone. He pulled Jill gently to her feet, wrapping his cloak around her shoulders, and beckoned Humpty and Jack to follow. It took a moment for Jack to remember to tell his feet to move. It would take even longer for the reality of the situation to sink in completely. The king, their father, was dead. Someone had killed him, and Jack and Jill could be next. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. Castles are well known for their ability to keep out intruders. Unless, of course, those intruders call that castle their home. So it shouldn't have been a surprise to find Jack, Jill, and Humpty floating on a boat in the river, making their way into the kingdom that only they knew. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life. Shush! I told you! He could be following us! And I told you, Sconce wouldn't do that! He and Father were friends! You saw how he cried the moment we were out of danger? Jack rolled his eyes as he continued to row. Uh, It was an act. It had to be. It was much too convenient that he just happened to turn up with Humpty just as Father's death was announced. Uh, He was running. He disabled Humpty to keep himself safe while he killed our... And he tried to hide us away to keep us from finding the truth. Just just trust me for once, Jill. This is our best chance of making things right. Unconvinced, Jill shook her head with a sigh as their boat bumped jarringly against the opposite bank. A tall oak tree grew stubbornly sideways in the packed mud. Jack climbed its roots nimbly as he and Humpty helped Jill find her footing. How are we even going to find who did it? I, I don't know. I know someone who might. Even if we did get the star back, are you sure we should even use it? Father made it clear wishes only cause more problems. Only if you wish for something with selfish intentions. And wishing for our father back is not selfish. Jack leaned unsteadily from the warped branch and jumped atop the wall as confidently as a mouse into a trap. 
before it knows it's a trap, of course. With an arm outstretched to catch her, Humpty helped Jill do the same. So Jill followed closely behind her brother, hoping beyond hope that their father had been right. Hickory Dickory Dock The mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down. Hickory Dickory Dock Now very few knew how to get to the top of the clock tower, and those that did, didn't venture there often. The inside was loud and riddled with pinching, crushing, or stabbing hazards. And the outside? Well, it was windy, cold, and generally too high up for comfort, even with the wooden railings. But Jack had spotted someone he needed perched there. So to the top of the clock tower they ventured. Mallard! Mallard! The butcher stood staring over the kingdom, leaning much too comfortably against the flimsy wood that separated him from a grisly fall. His long wool coat flapped unfastened for once in the crisp breeze like a war flag. Rye stood leaning against the wall behind him, but both jumped up as soon as they saw the children. There you two are. Do you realize we've been looking for you? I know. We, we ran into some obstacles. Jack looked over at his sister, trying to maintain a strong expression, and rightfully failed the moment he met her tear-filled gaze. Mallard's sternness softened as he studied the pair of heirs. Uh, I am sorry for the loss of the... of your father. He was... he was a good man. Mallard opened his arms, welcoming the children into his embrace as tears glistened in his own eyes. Jack and Jill both accepted gratefully. It was a special occasion. The butcher rarely offered hugs. Or had he ever, Jill wondered. It was then that her fingers brushed something sharp and buzzing with energy, hidden in a pocket of the butcher's coat. Jack quickly pulled away, gently ushering her to do the same. There'll be time for this later. I agree. Rye, get them to safety. We mustn't let whoever did this... No, I have a plan. As do I. It's called making sure neither of you get hurt as well. Oh, hang on, at least let me explain first. You can explain once you're safe. Where did you get that? Everyone stood frozen, staring at the glistening wishing star in Jill's open palm. In one frantic motion, Mallard snatched it out of her hand. Rye's grip tightened on the twins' hey. arms as Jack began to struggle even harder. The baker cast a wary glance at Humpty. Will she attack? She can't hurt us. Sconce made sure of that. How do you have father's star? Sconce said that whoever killed him must have taken it. Was it you? Did you... Kill? Our father? I didn't kill your father. His sharp gaze fell pointedly on Humpty. Your guardian assisted me. <gasps> we did what had to be done. What? Their mechanical nurse stood frozen by the railing, scratching at the hole in her chest. Your father was a good man, but a sorry excuse for a king. Look at this kingdom he created. We constantly live in fear. Many have died under his reign, including his own wife. Rhyme deserves better. We need a new start, a better ruler. This kingdom needs me. I had been waiting until every loose end was tied, but it looks like I can't wait any longer. I wish- No! I wish for the kingdom of Rhyme to be swept clean so that I might rebuild it by my own design. Jill! <gasps> Jack, Jill, even Rye ducked as Mallard held the star over his head triumphantly. But nothing happened. What? Why didn't it- uh, give, give me the star! No! You no. lied to me! I Stop! Wish for the said, kingdom. No give it to hurt. me! It I wish for Bo back! Or wish to make- Stop. A thud and a click stopped the combatants mid-swing. Mallard spun around. He knew that sound. Jack pushed himself up just in time to see... Jill? Jill stood silently. Tears streamed down her stony face, and they glistened as the remains of Humpty's heart sparked in her raised hand. Princess, think about what you're doing. This is how you did it, isn't it? This is how you killed him? In that moment... Jill felt something deeper than any grief or fear or bloodthirsty rage. She felt something even more dangerous. She felt hollow. One might even dare to say, heartless. And then you gave her a command. Please. Something like... It's in these moments of weakness that our choices are most important, when our minds are most corrupted by darkness. And in this moment, Jill chose wrong destroy him. 
No, don't destroy me. D destroy the kingdom. Destroy them. No. Jill, why? We don't know I what she'll think, do. I, I we need to get you down from here. Come on. The baker ushered the children to the exit just before the balcony crumbled and fell beneath Mallard's feet. The butcher fell. Humpty made sure of it before processing her next command. Destroy the kingdom. Jill ran across a crumbling wall towards Humpty with Jack following from a distance. Jill! I can fix this! I can fix this! The deadly machine was beating down a section of bricks as easily as if she were crushing an egg when Jill slid to a stop in front of her. Humpty, stop! Humpty stopped and stared at her charge, then raised her fists above Jill. <gasps> but before their mechanical friend could harm a hair on Jill's head, Jack pulled Jill away and shoved Humpty's <clears throat> heart back into her chest. Her eyes flickered and her fist lowered as she staggered back. Her clear eyes met Jack's as he began to smile. <laughs> <laughs> Just before the wall crumbled beneath them. Oh! No! Ah, Humpty, hello. Oh. So he finally found a way. I know you can't tell me, but I know it was him. Did he remove your heart? That's poetic, considering he practically removed his own long ago. I tried this before, you know. I'd hoped he had given up after the crows and the pie incident. <laughs> Evidently not. No, he was, he was never the same after his wife passed. He was killed by one of those monsters. Blamed it all on me and my mistakes so many years ago. <laughs> Yes, I know I can't stop you. You've been commanded to kill me, and so you will. Well, I'm ready now, now that the children are grown. I won't run this time, but I must give you one more command before you carry out your order. My wishing star, I want you to give it to Jack and Jill. I wish to give my final wish to my children. No one else may have this wish, only them and that they'll use it wisely. You may not remember this, but time will come regardless. Give it to them when they need it the most. You'll know the right time, I'm sure. Now, let Mallard taste his revenge. Bitter though it will be. Starlight, star bright, the first star I see tonight. I wish I may, I wish I might. Have the wish I wish tonight. Jill ran to Jack, who lay slumped in the rubble, unmoving. She grabbed his hand. His fingers barely moved to hold hers back, and his eyes barely opened. Uh, Jill? Yes, I'm here. I'm... <laughs> his grip went limp. His eyes closed as if he had drifted off to sleep, but Jill knew this was not the case. No, <laughs> me too, I'm sorry. From beyond the rubble, Sconce ran to join Please. the children the moment he saw them. Jill? Jill couldn't meet his eyes, and he soon understood why. Oh. With a series of crunches and painful squeaks, Humpty forced herself upright in the rubble and held out the still glowing wishing star with her lone arm. It it doesn't work. Humpty didn't listen. She pushed the star into Jill's hand with every bit of strength she had left. Before slumping over, broken beyond repair, with tears in her eyes, Jill held the star in limp fingers. I wish... I wish for healing. She buried her face in her brother's still chest. A long moment passed, silent aside from the breeze and the sobs, until... Jill? <gasps> Without question or hesitation, Jill tackled her brother in a hug. Uh, ow! You're alive. Did I fall again? <laughs> and that, my dear friend, is the true story of Rhyme. Yes, it came and it fell, as all kingdoms do. But as for its inhabitants, they found a new place to grow, somewhere that wasn't infested with hazardous creatures. So, I suppose, in a way, the kingdom of Rhyme lives on and it will forever be remembered in tales and songs and stories, even if they aren't as accurate as this one. <laughs>